Good afternoon. Okay. Well, I am very thrilled to be back here with my friends and family, if you will, here at the FMEC. And I'm going to take uh, the speaker's uh, prerogative here of partially disrobing. Because I'd like to share with you my pride in being connected with this organization, the FMEC. And I'd like to thank Larry and the committee for inviting me to come back to speak with you. I work for you. I work for you and the 100,000 plus members of the American Academy of Physicians who are students and residents, faculty, practicing physicians. And what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about what I've seen in this past year. I've been with the Academy just over a year now. And so I need to orient you because I spent my career professionally in New Jersey. And so here we are and let's see where we can go. And so here's the American Academy of Family Physicians. If you look up at the corner there, you see the AAFP. My office is below the first day there. I've got a great view of the world from my office. So here we go. We're going to take a look at the window and take a look at what we see here in America, what's happening with U.S. healthcare. Well, I've got to share with you a story. We've had people, our patients, our communities, our families have been waiting a long time, waiting for the promise and hope of family medicine and of the healthcare system in this country, which has not yet been fully realized. But I'd like to take a step back and, and introduce you to what I'll call the prophets. Okay, so we're going to be challenged here in terms of some screen uh, resolution, but uh, we have prophets of, of family medicine. Our first prophet, Francis Peabody, New Englander, 1925, shared with um, with all of us the importance of being connected to our patients. And so what Francis Peabody said was that the, the, the secret of caring for the patient is in caring for the patient. That is, it's, there's a lot of noise out there, a lot of things going on, but what it's really all about is caring for our patients. Another, another prophet, T.F. Fox, known to his friends as, as Robbie Fox, was the editor of The Lancet. And he traveled the world to look at health care and how it was delivered. And he was a person that I think is most associated with the term personal physician. And so I have a couple quotes from, uh, from Robbie Fox. My guess is given our screen challenges here, we're not going to be able to read them fully, but what he challenges us to think about is that it is all about that personal relationship. And our role, if you will, is to be a friend and guide and someone that you have this established ongoing relationship with. Because at the end of the day, that's what our patients are looking for. Another one of our prophets, Barbara Starfield, unfortunately left us too, too short, after too short of time here. Uh, Barbara was recognized uh, at the FMEC meeting a couple years ago. Uh, Barbara is a, a, um, truly a pioneer. Uh, she, if you will, distilled what we do into four, uh, four aspects. You know, first, I don't know if we can get any help on our uh, screen resolution here while, uh, while I'm working, but anyway, the first uh, aspect here is uh, access to care and first contact care. She felt that if you can't get to the physician to provide the care that you need, then what's the point of having all these systems uh, in place? The second has to do with the uh, 
continuity of care. That is the ongoing connection of that patient with that physician. The third has to do with comprehensiveness. And that is those services that we provide to our patients. Our patients don't need to go shopping around for a variety of different um, you know, people to take care of them. We should be able to deliver what we can for them. And then the final one would be coordination of care. And that is providing the care within the system that we live in and operate. Okay. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's leave it right here for the moment. So these are our profits, but what happened along the way? Why did we end up having these wonderful ideas and thoughts and end up waiting for the train, if you will? Well, there's a lot that's happened in the, in the healthcare system. The environment has been toxic. Many people talk about there not being an American healthcare system per se because it is so broken. We've got perverse ways in which we pay for care. The more you do, the more you get paid. Uh, it, it has not been about the patient. It's been about everybody else many times other than the patient. And yet, we as family physicians have been out there doing our work and doing our best for our patients. So I'm here today to tell you that the train has arrived for family medicine. And the train is arriving and the world is very different and will be very different from this point forward no matter what happens in the election. So it's a different place out there, a different world. Um, as, you, uh, as you go around, you'll begin to see some different things. And I want to share with you briefly here today five major trends or megatrends that are occurring within the U.S. healthcare system that are good for us as family physicians, but more importantly, good for our patients. So, the first one. There are 500 practices around the United States, three states in the, in the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, and Ohio. We could add Kentucky if you want to add that to the Northeast, Larry. Uh, but there are actually nine, uh, eight states, rather, which are receiving a new type of payment for care. And this will revolutionize how care is delivered because why pay for volume when you can pay for value? And we know that our system, our healthcare system, and our country can't support or sustain what's happening. But for the first time, physicians will be paid for delivering the appropriate care 20% more uh, on average. Uh, and, and what are those physicians doing with that? Well, yes, it's nice to have the extra income, but what they're doing around the country is to take additional revenue and putting it back into their practices so that they could deliver the services that they really truly believe that their patients need and want. Second trend. We've always had a piece missing of our healthcare system and we've struggled with this in this country for a long time and that is the integration of mental health into primary care. Our challenge has always been that care that we've needed has not been there when the patient needs it and we need to have it provided. And so we have, especially here in the Northeast and on, on, today, on the program today I saw that a number of talks talking about the integration of mental health into primary care. Because if you think about it, about 60% of problems that our patients face are related to uh, either modifiable behaviors or uh, uh, needing to, if you will, do the right thing with their guidance and, and, and certainly mental health disorders. And so we have the need to have those integrated models and they are beginning to emerge. Let me share with you a, a third trend. This is an interesting one. And that, this trend has to do with a byproduct of our integrated uh, electronic health records. For all of you who have electronic records and have kind of learned along the way how painful that can be initially, one of the true benefits of an electronic record, especially when it's shared in a community, is that other people are beginning to see the work that we do. And so I was just uh, in another community earlier this week and they said, 
boy, it's amazing. Now that the cardiologists see the work that I do with the patients because they're reading it, they're, they're, they're realizing that we should be delivering care. And they're telling their patients who don't have family physicians, you need a family physician because they need to be the quarterback, if you will. And so we, we, we actually are, as a byproduct of the integrated electronic me medical record, becoming recognized and assuming our rightful role as the quarterback of the team. How many of you have a smartphone? Just smartphones? How many of you tweet about what's going on in your life? A bunch of you. Okay, well you are participating in probably one of the most exciting areas of uh, healthcare right now. Uh, each year, for the last three years, there has been something called the data palooza. Now remember, information is power. Think about this. If you have the flu or a flu-like illness and you tweet, you know, I'm feeling kind of crummy, my head hurts, I'm kind of achy, and so on, and you're doing that and maybe a friend here and there, you know, maybe your friends will know, notice what's going on. Well, it turns out with the swine flu epidemic, there were over three million tweets of people talking about their symptoms. And what we're learning is that the power of social media and other, other uh, information technology is allowing us to gather data. And so places like New York City, uh, I think about a year ago, there was an outbreak of salmonella. And uh, the, what the researchers who were following all of this found was that just by reading the content of the tweets, they were able to pinpoint the delicatessen or restaurant where the outbreak had started two weeks before the health department. And so there's a power in information. There are people, uh, particularly from the American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, the Robert Graham Center for Research, who are working with the CDC and others to empower family physicians to get the information they need using uh, smart tools to help us deliver better care. Earlier this week, I was in uh, Portland, Oregon, and had the experience uh, of having some problems with my shoulder. I've had probably a torn rotator cuff and some other problems. And uh, I was talking about that, and uh, John Salts, the chairman of the Department of Family Medicine, said to me, oh, why don't you drop by the clinic, and we'll have one of our, our people uh, do an ultrasound of your shoulder. I said, well, I have an MRI scheduled next week. He said, no, 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 don't, don't. He said, cheaper, good information. We'll get an we'll ultrasound of your shoulder with our family docs. And he, then he shared the important story that I'd like to share with you, and that is, the fragmentation of healthcare in this country is driving us back to a more comprehensive scope of medicine within family medicine. He said that in their clinics, they could not get orthopedic referrals because all the orthopedics, or, or, or local or, orthopedists, were so subspecialized. They said, the chair of, uh, of orthopedics said, I don't know who to send to help you to see your patients. I've got a back guy, but your patients don't always have back problems when we show up, and I've got a, an elbow guy who's, who probably won't help you, and a left toe guy, but you know what? You guys need to be doing the care because you're the, you're the generalist, you can do it all, and we just have to help you with the tools. And so tools like this handheld ultrasound machine are revolutionizing our scope of practice uh, in this country. Uh, yesterday morning, I was with a group of leaders, and I heard about, a uh, in California, a department chair of OBGYN who is hiring family physicians to do uh, maternity care because they don't, they don't want to do it. They think the family docs can do maternity care just as well, if not better. And so our scope of practice is changing. Anybody recognize this, uh, this portrait, this photo? Any literary folks out here? This is John Steinbeck. 
the author, Grapes of Wrath, and, and so on. John uh, had an experience that he wrote about. In 1964, his family physician retired. And his new physician asked him to fill out a, a, some forms uh, to, if you will, uh, reestablish a medical history. And on the forms, uh, he, there was a place for a um, uh, fill in the blank, if you will. And I don't expect you to read this, but basically he wrote a letter to his doctor. And in the letter, he talked about, you know, basically you should have all this information and so on. But what really matters to me, what I'm really looking for is in a physician is a friend with some special knowledge. And I want to go back to our This We Believe uh, talk we just heard. What, what we're talking about at the end of the day are those special relationships that make the difference to our patients. And despite all the high tech and all the high touch and the data and all of that stuff, it all boils down to that relationship that we have. And I, I can't help it being in Ohio uh, to, to share some uh, pictures from Ohio here, but it is about the patient and, and the physician in that relationship. And so, as I conclude here this, this afternoon, the train has arrived. Some of you are aboard the train already. Some of you are not sure if you want to get on the train. But this is what it's going to take. You do need a ticket to get on the train. And this is what the ticket involves. You have to have passion. You have to believe. You have to believe that what you can do is to make a difference in the lives of our patients, their families, and our communities. And with that, I'll end my remarks. Those are five mega trends that I'm seeing right now. We could probably go on for an hour and talk about another half dozen mega trends that are occurring in family medicine and in medicine in general. But uh, I wish you well. I thank you. I just want to add uh, a, uh, a welcome to those who are considering family medicine. Certainly, there are a lot of great people around here to talk to. I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, FMEC is great. Uh, I certainly invite you to the national conference uh, in August. Uh, if you think FME is great, FMEC is great, think about putting this on steroids and uh, invite you to the national conference and to our global health workshop. Thank you.